Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Andrea Kamen, and I'm filling in for your instructor today. So we're going to be talking about musculoskeletal. And I teach a couple of other sections of adult health. So I am familiar with what you guys have been doing up until this point. Second, and then we'll get started. And just as an FYI, um, I am doing what I'm finding in my classes is there are some test taking issues. So I um, set up a test taking strategy session in through the CTL. So that will be on Fridays at 1.30. So if you're interested, you're more than welcome to join us. Um, basically, what I'm going to be doing is answering practice questions with you guys. But doing it, we're going to kind of be focused not on, not on test-taking skills like ABCs and Maslow's and that kind of thing. But what we're going to do is really break those questions down, look at what are the What's the significance of some of that information? Um, because sometimes in reviewing exams with students, I see that they're just missing the significance of something, right? They're just not thinking it out far enough. So we're just gonna kind of look at, you know, how to make connections between what pieces of information that the question is giving you and how to do that application and critical thinking and hopefully come up with the correct answers. So feel free to join us if you'd like, uh, you can go it's in the CTL Fridays at 1.30, and I think it's called Test Taking Strategies. So, um, all right, let's talk about musculoskeletal. As body systems go, this is kind of a pretty straightforward one, I think. Not as difficult as some of the other ones that <laughs> we've gone through this, uh, this year so far. All right, so the bones serve many purposes. They support the body, they protect the vital organs. So think about the rib cage. There's a reason the heart and lungs are set deep inside the rib cage. It's gonna make them harder, harder to injure. Uh, they help maintain body temperature. Obviously they're responsible for movement. Forget that the bone marrow is where blood cell or yeah, blood cells are made, hematopoiesis. All right. So when you think about bones, you need to be thinking about calcium. So fluid and electrolytes, right? We never get away from fluid and electrolytes. And calcium works with buddies. A lot of these electrolytes kind of buddy up with another electrolyte in order to do what needs to be done. So calcium will definitely requires a vitamin, vitamin D, in order for it to be absorbed. So the two most difficult things for the body to absorb is calcium and um, iron. Very hard. So think about that. If you have any kind of absorption issues, like, I don't know, Crohn's maybe, right away, you'd be thinking, okay, what's not, what's not getting absorbed? And very often that's calcium. So you need vitamin D. The thyroid hormone, we're gonna talk about that, cortisol. You'll notice that all of these are hormones. And we're gonna talk about that in more detail. So I'm not stopping here now. I am gonna say that you need to know foods high in calcium, because that would be a typical test question. And, you know, if you are going to do patient teaching 
and you want them to increase their the amount of calcium they get, then you're going to need to know what foods to tell them to do that with. So we're going to talk about all that in more detail. And apparently we're not doing that now because now we're going to diagnostic procedures. <laughs> Let's start with arthroscopy because that is really the go-to for any kind of, of joint. So arthroscopy, scopy is always scope, which means we're going to go in and take a look at arthro always refers to a joint. So we can go in with a camera on the end and take a look at what is going on in there, what the damage is. Uh, some indications for that would be if, if there's joint swelling, pain, joint instability, go in and do an assessment. When they're in there, they can also do surgery. So I'm sure you've heard of arthroscopic surgery. So what that's really telling you is that they are using arthroscope. And while they're in there, they're doing surgery. So this is a lot like what we were talking about with cardiac catheterizations. You can go in there and you can look around. And you can go in there and do things. So uh, commonly going to repair torn ligaments. That is, that's a very common type of knee repair. Um, those ligaments get torn easily. I shouldn't say easily. That's a better word. Frequently. You see a lot of people with these kind of tears for one reason or another. Um, and also a synovial fluid biopsy. So times that this would be contraindicated would be if there is any kind of um, damage or infection in the joint. So if you have sepsis of the joint, we're not going to go in there and do that. Um, free procedure. So I always tell my students there are three things that you need to think about for every single diagnostic test or procedure. Three things. Do you need informed consent? Will there be sedation? Will there be contrast dye? Those are three major nursing considerations for any uh, diagnostic or procedure. So would you need informed consent for this? Yes, you would. Yeah. Okay, what's, what's, the, what's the criteria for needing informed consent? They're How do you know we need? Oh, because they're cutting into a patient's body. Okay, so anything that's invasive is definitely gonna re require informed consent. Whose job is it to get informed consent? The nurse makes sure it's signed and it's in the patient's chart, but the physician would go over like risks and benefits. Absolutely. So it is up to the, to the physician or the surgeon to obtain the informed consent. And then the nurse's job is make sure there is one on the chart and also to double check with, this, with the uh, patient do they have any additional questions? And they almost always do because doctors don't necessarily break it down in a way that makes sense. And people tend to be sometimes a little intimidated by doctors. And so even if they don't fully understand, well, they don't really want to say anything, right? So it's good to always follow up with informed consent. Did you understand what the doctor said? Do you have any questions? And a lot of times you can answer those questions because they may be about, well, you know, what's going to happen before I go down or what's going to happen when I get there or what's going to happen when I come back. And those are all well within nursing scope of practice. If they start asking you questions that are definitely not within your scope of practice, then you pick up the phone and you call the surgeon and say, you got to come back up here because this patient still has questions. So that's your job as it relates to informed consent. All right. Would there be contrast dye used here? In a knee scope? I'm sorry? 
Are you asking if there would be contrast dye used on a knee scope procedure? Yeah. I don't think so. No, there would not be. And anytime there is contrast dye, what is our job as the nurse? What, what's the significance of that? Verifying their allergies. Absolutely. Verifying the allergies before they go down and what when they come back. Oh, fundies. This is fundies. The adverse reaction. Well, yeah, you're definitely going to be looking for that. Um, and, and you'll assess that in the beginning. Now, you know, if they have an allergy, it doesn't mean we're not going to do it, but it means that we might premedicate them and always make sure that the surgical staff is aware. Uh, but when they come back, contrast dye can be very hard on kidneys. So the goal is we want our, as nurses, we want to get that flushed out as soon as they come back. So we're going to do lots of fluid. And then conscious sedation or anesthesia. What is our main concern anytime someone is sedated? Respiratory depression. Absolutely. So that's going to be your priority assessment. All right. So remember those three things and take them to every diagnostic or every procedure. And that would get you through the key nursing things that you need to do pre-procedure and post-procedure. All right. Uh, so here we are going to do um, informed consent. And then patient teaching begins. You know how we always say um, discharge teaching starts on admission? Well, same kind of rationale here, post-op. So we're going to start. And, and just the goal is that you want the patient to just have an understanding, to know what to expect, right? So there's no big surprises. And that will also really bring down their anxiety levels. So, you know, if they're concerned about, oh my gosh, this is going to be so painful, you know, then you can say, well, you know what? We're going to be managing your pain. So, you, you know, give them the information they need so that, that they're not going to be stressed out any more than they have to be. And what's going to come. So afterwards, after joint surgeries, they're, there's, they're going to have to exercise that joint. Um, so we want them to know that. And then you're just going to give them an overview of what to expect. Afterwards, we're going to do the six keys um, of neurovascular assessment. So what are the six keys? Do you remember for neuroassessment? Pain, pallor, paresthesia, pulky old something. Thermia. Yes. <laughs> Monitor temperature, yes, absolutely. I'm trying to remember which ones you said. Did you say paralysis? Missed that one. <laughs> there's one, there's one more. Pulses. Did you say pulses? No. Okay. So that is always going to be so critical. Again, it's like it was in a cardiac cath. There's nothing new here. This is, this is just a concept that's going to keep coming up. Anytime we go in, and we're cutting, sewing, doing trauma, because all surgery is really controlled trauma. And so you always want to make sure that below wherever we went in and did something, that they're getting adequate blood flow, that, that there isn't, we didn't get an occlusion developed. So it is critical to always check pulses. And uh, I worked with a nurse that did not do that. The client had a fempop bypass and revascular, which is just basically they revascularized, they bypassed an occlusion. And he did not check those fetal pulses for a 12 hour shift. And when the next nurse came on, of course she went in and did, and there wasn't one in that leg that had been operated on. And so they rushed her back to the OR 
but it had been too long and they ended up having to amputate that leg. And that was just from someone not making sure that there was adequate circulation. So it's critical. Anytime you have a surgical patient, do, <laughs> did we mess up circulation somehow? And how would you know? And in extremities like this, pulses, huge. All right. Um, also, we're going to obviously do uh, pain medication. And then the PRICE acronym, you know, we love our acronyms. So how are we going to protect that limb? So that is rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Because there is so much again, controlled trauma, there's going to be a lot of inflammation there, a lot of swelling, and that can do damage to that area. So we want to limit the amount of collateral damage. And so that's where this rest, ice, compression, and elevation come in. Okay, these can actually be done uh, as outpatients. And there's usually not a lot of bleeding associated with these. But anytime, you know, patient teaching is critical. But definitely, if you're going to send somebody home after this, you need to make sure that they know exactly what to expect and what to do and what to look for so they know when to call the doctor because we want them to be able to identify any kind of um, issues. And we'll talk more about assuming when we get to that part. Nuclear scans or bone scans. So this is where they use radioisotopes. And you can clearly see in this picture that it allows them to see exactly what's going on here. It is used um, when people are complaining of bone pain. Well, Bone pain can a lot of things. So this can be used to, to kind of narrow that field down and try to figure out what's going on. Pre-procedure, hmm. Do we need informed consent? Thanks. Yes. Yes. Even though it's a nuclear scan, we are putting those radioisotopes in. So that's going to be considered invasive. And obviously, we're going to use some kind of contrast medium here as radioisotopes. So we are going to be checking for allergies and pregnancy. There are certain things we don't want to do when there are fetuses involved and kidney disease. And again, Always remember that when we are injecting something into the body, whatever it may be, what goes in has to come out. And most of the time, it is going to be the kidneys responsible for excreting that. And if you have someone that doesn't have really good kidney function, then whatever you're putting in there may not be able to become excreted and that can create um, some toxicities. So again, those are things you're going to assess for before this patient goes down. As for what needs to happen while they're there is they just need to lie still. And this procedure can, can take a while. This can take easily an hour. And so one of the things that you need to be doing is assessing your patient. Uh, can they follow instructions? Do they have the mental capacity? to follow instructions? Do they have the mental and physical capacity to be still for that length of time? So that's gonna be part of your pre-procedure assessment. Post-procedure, we're gonna encourage fluids. Hmm, why are we gonna do that? To flush the kidneys. Yeah, to get rid of those dyes, get them out of there. Okay. Complications, kidney damage. And that is true, again, with any chemicals that we're putting in the body because the kidneys have to deal with that afterwards. And that can definitely do some actual damage to the kidneys, intracellular damage. Uh -huh. Then we have DEXA scans, dual energy X-ray 
<laughs> absorption absorb geometry. You'll sometimes see it as DEXA as well. DXA or DEXA, same thing. And basically what this is doing is it is measuring the density of the bone. And this would be an important diagnostic if it is suspected that there is thinning of the bone, which is going to be osteoporosis. There are other ways to, to, uh, to assess bone density, but far and away, this is going to be the most accurate way. You can go to a lot of uh, screenings out in the community, and they'll, they have little things that they'll put on your heel, and it will give you a little reading, and that's okay. It'll give you an initial, sorry, trash truck. Closer. It'll give you some information, but it, 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 it's nowhere near this level. So this is the serious um, estimator of bone density. Another thing that we would be doing with um, the musculoskeletal system is nerve conduction. So if you remember from patho, Every muscle in the body needs a little jolt of electricity in order to get that contraction. So you may have some muscle problems where your muscles are just not functioning properly. And it may not be a calcium problem or a vitamin D problem or, or even a hormone problem. It may be that we're just having inadequate nerve conduction. So the muscles are not really getting adequate messaging that this is what they need to be doing. So the electromyography, the electro is telling you it is measuring the electricity. Myo is muscle. Graphy is a recording. Uh, so this will tell you if we have neurological disease, because again, it's the neurosystem that is creating that electricity to the muscles, neuromuscular and muscular disease. So any of those are going to come under this umbrella. Complications, infection, always. So pre-procedure. Uh, so we want to be looking for contraindications, things that we don't want to have happen. And anticoagulation might be an issue, right? Can you see what they're doing here? This is not a good picture, I think, but it, it is a little bit, it can be, it can be invasive, right? Because what they're trying to do is they are trying to, to stimulate the electrical impulse or the muscle response. So we're looking at how is the muscle responding if we shoot some electricity through there, basically. Um, so needles are used, and I think you can see that here. It's not a great picture, but we're definitely gonna stick needles in there um, and also use electrodes as well. And this, this that particular um, issue would be for, oh my gosh, things like um, ALS, which is um, sclerosis and sclerosis, any kind of sclerosis, no matter where it is in the body, is like a scar tissue and electricity does not move through scar tissue like it does healthy tissue. And that's why in the heart, when you have an MI and there's damage to the heart, it shows up on the EKG. Why? Because the electricity comes down and it hits that, that damaged tissue and it gets, it gets refracted. It just bounces off. So same kind of thing that we can tell here. Carpal tunnel would be another reason that you would get this. Ghislaine Barre, um, muscular dystrophy, myasthenia gravis. So any of the disorders that are neuromuscular, this might be a study that would be done. So if we're going to be putting needles into someone, anticoagulation, right? We wanna know. Are they on any, any kind of blood thinning medication? Because that's, that's an issue. Um, also, muscle relaxers 
because again, if they are on muscle relaxers and for this particular group of people, if they're having muscle issues, it, it could very well be that they've been prescribed some sort of muscle relaxation pill, right? And if they have, and then we do this study, well, obviously we're not gonna get adequate results. So we want to assess for the medications that they're on any medication that would interfere with the results of this and um, any kind of skin infections or skin issues, because again, we're going through the skin. Patient education. So the day of the test, we don't want them to do any lotion or, or put anything on their skin. And then post-procedure, we're just looking for expected findings, what you would expect if we're putting little needles in people. So we're gonna be looking for bruising. What could we do to prevent a hematoma? Ice. Maybe ice. Yeah, there you go. I was gonna say, don't overthink it. Just put some ice on there and just you know cut off that that because again, when you put a needle in there, you're creating damage. It's minor, but it's still damage, and so the body's gonna come. And with that, in, with that inflammation response. So we don't want that to happen. So you can do it just with icing. Um, and later you can do warm compresses if, um, if it's still painful. All right. So now let's talk about how we're actually going to treat joint disease. Arthroplasty, so there's the arthro again. Arthro is joint and plasty is going to be that, um, that if you remember, you see plasty in, in several uh, diagnostics and treatments. So basically what they're going to do is go in and take out the damage or put in a prosthetic. So, trying to cover. So you can. So normally, what happens? You know what? I should have done this the other way. I think it always makes more sense to understand the disease before we start looking at the at the um, at the diagnostics. All right. Basically, in a total knee replacement, everything is going to get replaced or same thing with the hip. So you can see here, the acetabulum, the femoral head, the femoral neck and stem, all of these can be replaced. This is very common. Replacement or just a partial joint replacement. So those are just the types of arthroplasty. Why are we going to do this? Well, improve quality of life and to treat osteo and rheumatoid arthritis and osteonecrosis. And we're going to talk a little bit later about how to tell the difference between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis because test questions like to intertwine both of them. And then you have to know which is which because they're not exactly the same. All right, problems that can occur, um, the hip can be dislocated, infection always, anemia, neurovascular compromise, and the big one is deep vein thrombosis. And then of course our concern there is gonna be pulmonary embolism. So it is important to do some um, anticoagulation prior to about that. Um, okay, why would we not do it? Um, there are certain comorbidities that would kind of rule that out. One of those would be, again, knee sepsis. So if you've got a septic joint, you, you don't want to go in there. And even if it's not in the joint, but you have an infection elsewhere in the body, mm, 
don't really want to do this. And another reason would be um, anybody with severe vascular disease. And, you know, think about what needs to happen again, controlled trauma here. What needs to happen afterwards is the body needs to heal the damage that gets done. And what does it need for that? It needs oxygen, nutrients, all of those things. And that comes from good vascular supply. So if you have someone that does not have that, then that's going to create a problem postoperatively. So they may not do that. There we go, arterial impairment in that extremity, yes. Uh, patient inability to follow post-surgical regimen. And again, that comes to you doing that good pre-procedure uh, pre assessment. Um, afterwards, there, there will be, they need to do the IS, the incentive spirometer. There may need to be transfusions. There may be, and probably will be, drains in place. Uh, transferring is going to be an issue. Exercises, there'll definitely be some activity limitations. They need to take their meds. They're going to be doing extensive PT for a while. They need to be monitoring for signs of infection. There will be dressing changes and then monitoring for DVT, PE, and bleeding. So, You know, that all of that is going to happen while they're still in the hospital, but that's also going to be ongoing when they go home. So it's important to know, can this person do this for themselves or do they have the support system they're going to need? People with, with any kind of ortho surgeries, they're going to need some help for a while. So it's important to make sure to do that assessment can this person reliably do all of these things that need to happen when they go home? If not, is there a family member? Because that's who you're going to do the primary teaching with. And barring that, um, then you're going to get social worker involved if there is no support system. Because these things absolutely have to happen in order for the patient to have a good outcome postoperative. We're going to do all right. So here are some things that we're going to be uh, thinking about postoperatively for both knee and hip. So pain management for both, antibiotics, anticoagulation, going to need to do some positioning for these people. So with knees, well, we don't want to float the heels. So in other words, we don't want to elevate that leg like that and have their, their legs hanging off. Um, can't see these pictures are over top of other things. Okay. So we don't want that knee to be flexed all the time. We don't want to float the heels and we want to limit deep knee bends. What they are going to be in is a machine that will, that will do the bend and stretch for them postoperatively. And that will be the doctor will um, write the order for how long that needs to be done how often it needs to be done, and the angle, how deep that bend will be. For hip replacements, we want to be sure that the leg is in the neutral position. So we don't want to turn it. It, it can't, what am I trying to say? Rotate it externally or internally. You want that to be straight on a hip replacement. Transfers are going to be more difficult. And so we need to transfer from the unaffected side. So if you think about that, you'll have them think, just visualize that, that transfer process. You've got to get them sitting up 
and then you're either going to get them standing up or you're going to sit them over in a chair. So they're going to be weight bearing on that unaffected side. So just picture that in your mind, how, how, how that would position them when they're standing, especially if you're going to turn them to sit down. You want to do that in a way where they're not going to, you're not going to knock them off balance like that. We always want to do early ambulation. And that's just true for basically everything. In the open heart surgical unit that I worked on way back in the day, um, we let people lay in bed for a week after open heart surgeries. Well, they had horrible outcomes. And then evidence came along and it's like, okay, well, people shouldn't be laying around. That's, that's a bad thing for the body. So now today, uh, post-op cabbages are sitting, we've got them up and sitting in a chair that night, and the next morning they are up and ambulating. And that is basically true, even for these ortho patients, they need to be up and moving as, as much as possible, because otherwise you start to get too many complications developing. So we want to probably try to walk them early and at least three times a day. And then you're just going to ice after and, and just keep that swelling under control. Oh, what else do we need to think about? Um, the, the big risk here is dislocation after, after that surgery. So again, you don't want to internally rotate. So the, the goal is we don't want that hip to start rotating, right? We want to keep that neutral. So you don't want to, we don't want their toes coming in like that because that's going to affect up here at the hip. Um, we don't want hip flexion. And to keep a pillow between the legs in bed in order to maintain that position because let's face it, if somebody dozes off, they may start moving without, even if they're, even if they know they shouldn't when you're asleep, body's going to do what it wants to do. So not just a regular pillow, they have specific pillows for this. And often they will have, um, so they're that hard foam, so it's not real smushy. And then they will have uh, Velcro on either side so that you position it between the legs, you get the, the legs lined up the way they need to be, and then you can just Velcro them so that it can't become dislodged as people you know, move around. We don't want them crossing their legs. We do want to provide them with elevated toilet seats because it's, again, <laughs> for them to get up and down and we don't want them getting too bent, too low down. So raised toilet seats and chairs, grab bars on things, definitely a shower chair, and then a walker when they start to ambulate because again, they're going to need that added support. All right. Any questions about any of the um, diagnostics? Pretty straightforward. Basically, the, what you have to do as the nurse before and after is the same as probably almost all other diagnostic tests that need to be done. All right. Let's talk about amputations. Oh, amputations. Um, are usually either because of a significant traumatic injury like car accidents or because of cardiovascular or neurovascular issues. So if you come upon this out in the field, then you definitely want to apply direct pressure or a tourniquet because if the artery has been severed, then every time the heart beats, you're just pumping blood right out of the body. So it is critical to, to tourniquet or tie off that blood flow until you can get help. And then you want to protect that severed or partially severed limb with anything clean that you can find, a clean cloth, bag, whatever. 
and then we're going to submerge that in ice water. So the goal here, and that's especially true when you're looking at fingers and toes, things like that. Look for them, right? Don't, don't just look like they're gone. Look for them and try to um, preserve them. And that's where the ice comes in. Keep them clean so they don't get infected and keep them iced down because hopefully they can get reattached. Now that doesn't always happen, but it can happen. And, and a lot of, you know, the planets have to align correctly for that to happen. Um, they have to get somewhere very quickly. Um, that may or may not happen, but always try to retrieve the digits and preserve them and bring them in. Thermal injury is another reason people lose extremities. Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Frostbite would be one of those ways. And then, like I said, the other way is going to be peripheral vascular disease. And um, so if, if there is ischemia that gets worse and worse until finally you just don't have adequate blood flow at all to the extremity, well, you know, if cells don't get oxygen and nutrients, eventually they're going to begin to die. And when you start having a lot of cells dying, then that's going to create um, infection. And eventually that will become gangrene. When a limb or a digit becomes gangrenous, it must be amputated. It must be amputated because if it isn't, that will kill you. That is, that is just so, so that is a big foregone conclusion. Um, malignancies may cause loss of limb. That does happen sometimes. And the other thing is bone infection, which is called osteomyelitis. There is nothing worse than bone infection or bone cancers. Anything with bones is excruciatingly painful. And what makes them so difficult to deal with is that it's, it's, bone is not highly vascular. So it makes it very hard to treat. So whether you're putting in chemo or you're putting in antibiotics, very, very hard to treat. A lot of times you just have to open that up depending on where it is and, and treat it directly. So it is extremely painful and extremely dangerous. So a lot of not good outcomes with that. All right. Um, what are you gonna do with people that have amputations? Well, Obviously, I think, obviously, bleeding is going to be the primary post-operative complication. So you need to monitor for that. They will have, um, when they come out post-operatively, they will have um, a, a wrap on it and, and a usually something that's a little bit like a compression stocking a little bit over that stump. The stump needs to be elevated for the first 24 hours. After that, you're not gonna, you're not gonna keep it elevated. And the reason for that is that if you elevate a stump after that long-term, what happens is you start to do damage to those ligaments and tendons and muscles. So that's not a long-term strategy, but in the beginning, that first 24 hour period, you absolutely want to keep it elevated to, because again, trauma, major trauma. And, you know, think about inflammation. When you have inflammation, I don't care where it is in the body, you're going to have these four things, heat and redness, count them as one, swelling, pain, and fluid buildup. I worked on a cardiovascular unit in case you haven't figured that out yet. And on our open heart surgeries, I have seen people post-operatively gain 40 pounds, 40 pounds of fluid weight. 
that's a lot. And that's just from the inflammation from the trauma, which is why those people have chest tubes, otherwise it blow their chest open. But same thing here. There can be, when you have this level of trauma, even though it's controlled, there can be enormous fluid buildup. And so in that first 24 hours, you wanna to try to get that flowing back to the heart. And the reason for that is that you don't want this tissue to be degraded in any way because hopefully, hopefully, we can preserve this stump and outfit the person with the prosthetic. But if this stump gets damaged, the chances of them being fitted for a prosthetic really start to go down. And that's a big deal because, you know, that, that really limits what you can do. I mean, people can do all kinds of things if they can get the prosthetic. So that really is important. Um, direct pressure if there's bleeding, tourniquet if there's bleeding. We are going to monitor for infection just like you would anywhere for any other post-op. Um, and there will be dressing changes. My friend had an amputation below the knee and um, he used to get tons of phantom pain. <clears throat> and they never, like he would take gabapentin and stuff like that, but it wasn't ever very helpful. Have they figured anything out yet? He passed away. Um, but is there anything now that they use other than gabapentin? They do use several things. And actually, at some point here in the future, we're going to go, we're going to break out into groups and we're going to address phantom pain. And then when we come back, I'll talk to you about that. Yeah, definitely an issue. And not just in amputations, but a friend of mine was paralyzed from the neck down and he couldn't move anything below here. And he had the same thing. He could feel his, he could feel his legs, right? Which of course he couldn't because he had no sensation. But what he would tell me is, oh, come put my legs down, put my legs down, they're up again. And he, he could feel his legs rising, which of course they were on the bed, but and then I would just go over and just and just do this and 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 he could he felt better. So it's an interesting thing. We're gonna have that conversation, Christina, because I find I find it fascinating and I have a I have another take on that. So we'll talk. All right, we're gonna monitor tissue perfusion. Again, critical anytime, anywhere we're doing anything, we've got to make sure that we're getting adequate tissue perfusion. Again. That is so important on this stump. So are we going to be able to take a pulse here? So how else are we going to know if we are getting adequate perfusion? Why don't you check a pulse above the site? Well, you could, absolutely you could. Um, but how would, that, that would help. But you could just do by observing the stump itself, right? If you're starting to, same thing as if you were doing an extremity. Is there pallor? Is there, is it cold? Is it, you know, just the, the kind of basic things that we always do when we're looking for hypoxia, which is what you'd be seeing here. Um, antibiotics, of course. Uh, I say, of course, but not everybody gets post-operative antibiotics, but when you get something this massive, definitely going to have that uh, prophylactic. Oh. Now, Christina, I think we're getting to pain. So incisional pain, yes, we're going to do analgesics. Phantom pain, um, more likely in non-traumatic amputations. Uh, so they say, I, I, you know, I, I've seen it pretty consistently across the board in amputees. So here are some of the medications, some of the medications that they're using to try and get this under control. Um, other therapies are massage, heat, TENS machine, which I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it is um, 
a little or it gives little shocks to it yeah it's transcutaneous electron it's so you put electrodes on and it just um gives a little electrical stimulation to the tissue i've got one at home i use it all the time for my back anytime my back gets back bad i slap it on it's like oh, it's wonderful um relaxation therapy mirrors okay so this interesting thing um they they because part of and the, the rationale behind this is that the brain of course is interpreting that we're having pain down here right even though the limb's gone the brain is saying yeah the limb may not be there but i'm still feeling pain so one of the therapies they try is to to convince the brain that this is not possible and they use that by by with mirrors and the idea behind it is that you you sort of force the brain to recognize that we don't have a limb here now i don't know how successful that is uh, but, but you're going to find with amputation pain and phantom pain that that they're trying anything and everything because there's not not a high success rate for that at all. All right, complications. Huge psychosocial, huge psychosocial complications. The this is, oh my goodness. Um, you know, I mean, really think about it. Think about losing a limp. We take our bodies for granted, right? We always do. I expect to be able to go out and do what I want to do every day. I expect to, to, you know, and all of a sudden, if that gets taken away from you, it is, it is like a betrayal. It is, you know, it is a deep betrayal. It's such a deep wounding. And people, people will grieve heartily. And so, you know, as nurses, a big, really what, what sets nursing apart from medical, honestly, is that we're looking at the whole person. We're not just looking at the medical, which doctors are, right? We are also looking at, wow, how is this affecting your life outside of here? Is this going to affect your livelihood? Is this going to affect your family, um, you know, the roles in the family or the family dynamics? Like we're looking at all of that kind of stuff. So they are absolutely going to be struggling psychologically with this. So that requires constant assessment. And remember, um, the grieving process is, is really a process and it's not linear. So, you know, you start with what anger and then bargaining, you know, we go through the whole thing and, but it's not like, okay, I'm done with that. I'm moving into the next, the next phase. We're kind of going in and out of all of them. And it's good for you as the nurse to recognize where this person is in their process and to support that and be there for them. And a lot of times, you know, really be clear about this, because I think sometimes it's, it's difficult for students to really understand what that means when we're talking about supporting someone psychologically. And it does not mean that you have to solve their problems, right? It's because, you know, you can't, you can't. <laughs> so sometimes it's just allowing them to talk it out, to just, you know, if you had something happen and you're talking to a friend and really, it's just you sort of thinking out loud with another person there. And that's really all you need, right? So sometimes just being there and allowing them to express that grief because they may not want to do that with the family. And so they may not have anyone else they can do that with. But to have a caring person that has no stake in their life that they can not have to worry about burdening, right, with their issues. We play a big role as nurses in, in, in facilitating that role. All right, other complications, hypovolemia. 
okay, well, <laughs> that makes sense, right? We put those pieces together. Infection, we've talked about. All right, contractures. And this is what I was talking about earlier, which is why we do not want to elevate that limb for any length of time because we can start to get contractures. And that is a problem because again, remember our goal, what's the long-term goal here? The long-term goal here is to get a, get a prosthetic on somebody so they can lead a pretty normal life. That's the goal. So if we start having damage to these tendons and ligaments, that may not happen. So it's so important. And the way we do that is with range of motion, keep the stump flat on the bed after that first 24 hours, lie prone 20 to 30 minutes every, several times a day. And we don't want them to do a lot of prolonged sitting right away either. So these are the things that we're going to hopefully prevent these complications from arising. All right. Well, that worked out just about right. Let's take a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back and do something else.
Okay, I just posted two things in the chat. One is the top one is the document that I want you to have access to that we're going to work on here in a minute. Whoops, about phantom pain. Back here, I can find it. There we go. Okay, so this is the document that that one link is to. The link below it is um, the link to the test taking strategy workshop that I'm doing every Friday. So that's the link if you're interested that you can use that to enroll. Okay, so what we're going to do is break up into groups. You love group work? <laughs> okay. I didn't like it much when I was in school, but here we are all these many years later and we're still doing it. And there's a rationale for that. We have to work together in nursing. It's, it's a team sport, as we say. So what I want you to do, we're going to break up into two, four, six, eight, nine groups. Group one takes the first drug here. Group two takes the second. Group three takes the third. Just go right on down the line. And what I want you to do is complete this form. What does that drug do? And how does that possibly help with phantom limb pain? And then you can do some examples over here, some pictures some different things just to make it interesting. And then we'll come back and you can share what you found out with everybody else. All right, any questions about what we're doing? Let's see if I can get Zoom to cooperate with me, which is not always the case. Stop sharing and see. Oh, here we go. And I said, how many? Nine. Yes. All right. Visit. Take about 30 minutes if you need that much. All right. And I will come around.
Sierra, are you there? Sierra? Sorry, hi. Hey, okay, I was just checking to see if you were there. I'm gonna go ahead and put you into room three.
Okay, that looked pretty interesting. And I see some of the research has changed on a couple of things. So uh, particularly on the mirror thing. So I can't wait to hear about that because that's a definite change from the last time that I had worked with mirror therapy. So does anyone want to volunteer to uh, tell us about their treatment? Or do we need to go numerically? I can do relaxation therapy since there's not there's not too much to say except for examples. Okay. Well, I think that was somewhere down here. Okay, great. Okay. So basically relaxation therapy. Um it's I forget what the first box asks box asks for, but it relaxes the body and muscles in this helps to reduce the stimulation to the stump um, or wherever, you know, which body part was amputated. Um, and so the middle box, there wasn't a ton of pathophysiology for this one. So we found that it targets the cortical reorganization, um, autonomic nervous system deregulation, and then stress management and coping ability and quality of life. I think those last few are what they improve. Um, and what you can do to kind of help improve those systems. And then the last one are just a bunch of examples for relaxation therapy. So such as meditation, guided imagery had a lot of um, research for it. And basically it just decreases um, your pain level. That's what like the majority of the studies were saying is that pain level decreased significantly with guided imagery. I wonder did you see anything on hypnotherapy for phantom limb pain? I did. One of the research articles I read, like the first one was hypnosis. And so hypnosis, it showed that, um, I believe it said, I don't have it pulled up anymore, but it said that, um, it basically tricks the brain into, um, I forget the word they used. basically processing pain was different. Um, I'm not sure okay. if you have more to speak so on it that, was but. It was effective or at least partially yeah. effective? Yeah, partially. For the people they studied, um, I believe it was about half said that um, they saw significant improvement. So, I mean, I think it just depends on what works for you for this one, but yeah. yeah. Um, and then the biofeedback was another one that was pretty effective as well. Um, and this works, I know, for like other things such as like anxiety and depression. Um, mm -hmm. That's a really good one. So this one also showed pretty good, um, pretty good success rates with biofeedback. And then the autogenic training, I don't really know what this one was. I don't know if you know what that is. No, but we can certainly find out. Sorry, I guess I should have Googled it let's, first. <laughs> let's just take a look at that real quick. Autogenic training, so we can guess, but let's take a look. Lower the mind to relax the body. Okay, so basically, that almost sounds like meditation, doesn't it? Yeah, a little bit. If you're doing it, if, if you're doing it yourself by just controlling the mind. Yeah. Uh, so I would see where that would be pretty effective. Hang on, lost our sheet. Here we go. So you're seeing pretty high success rates then. For yeah, students. for especially the guided imagery, um, meditation, um, the first few are actually very, um, very successful, especially the uh, biofeedback and the guided imagery. Those ones are like the top ones. There's um, a lot of research on guided imagery. Um, there was a woman, Bella Ruth Napperstack, who was doing guided imagery years and years ago, and she had a child with an inoperable brain tumor. And there was nothing anybody could do for him. And so what she did, it was back in the 70s when Star Wars came out. Star Wars was a big deal. And so he was young. He was like eight years old, I think. And she had him doing constant visualization where he was using the, you know, all the new age weapons that were in Star Wars. And he was pointing it at the tumor. <laughs> he was doing all this stuff. And that tumor went away. No so, way. 
That's so yeah, cool. It is extremely powerful or can be. So, but guided imagery has been around for a long time. So I doesn't surprise me there's more research on that. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. And the rest of these work pretty well. I mean, we talked about the whole yoga situation, I guess, depending on how, uh, how good you are with the rest of your body parts, it might work, but yoga for, I mean, people, especially who are double amputees, probably not going to happen. So, um, yeah, but the first few are definitely very, very successful according to the research. So that's really interesting. Thanks for sharing that. That is interesting. You know, I'm, I'm a naturopathic practitioner and have been for like, you know, way before, since way before I was a nurse. So I'm all about the, uh, the woo woo stuff. So that's good. And I'll be interested to see as we start talking about people with these other therapies, what the efficacy rate is for all of these and just see who's getting the best results. So, okay. Who wants to go next? Thank you, Haley. I can go first. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. We went from nobody to everybody. Everybody. Well, I'll go. I'll go next. Uh, my group had massage. Um, so massage supports phantom pain by calming the central nervous system, the nerves in this specific area, as well as the, as well as working the muscles that have been affected by the amputation specifically. Oh. Um, yeah. I am actually a medical-based massage therapist and I have worked on amputees with phantom pain. Oh. And so, so that's cool. I was pumped when I got put in this group. <laughs> so some hormones that are going to support this are oxytocin um, due to skin-to-skin -skin contact. Cortisol is reduced when you receive massage. Endorphins, which act as painkillers, they boost your mood and help with chronic pain. Dopamine, of course, is released. And then serotonin is also released, and that's going to help with mood, um, depression, physical pain, and food cravings. Um, and when I worked on some of my clients, um, so they had pain, phantom pain, but also did not receive a lot of touch. People were not sure how to touch them or hug them. They didn't want to hurt them. So... Yeah. A lot. I had one guy like start crying because I I was not phased and I'm like yeah this is just what I do, and he and I could tell it was helping him so much and and so eventually the phantom pain reduced and we were just working um because it elevated his mood significantly. Yes, and and you know those two things have to be have to be interconnected as well. Oh yeah, because you know whatever you know every thought you have creates chemical. So if you're having stressful, negative kind of thoughts, then those are the chemicals that you're creating, which can certainly contribute to that pain level. So that's awesome. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so massage is going to increase blood flow to the area, and that's going to help with any sort of atrophying that's trying to take place. Uh, atrophy is super uncomfortable. So that's going to cause all sorts of pain. Um, so circulation is a big thing. It's going to reduce swelling, um, correct muscle stiffness, prevent scar tissue. If you work with a therapist who's trained in scar work, um, this is an um, improved circulation will reduce spasms. Um, you can increase muscle length and yeah, help with sleep. If they're not sleeping, then they're going to have all sorts of issues. And then this study done by the university of Utah is pretty cool. Um, this is going to help with like mental anguish they place a mirror between the legs or on the chest to reflect the uninjured limb and then a massage therapist will massage that limb and so the patient is watching what looks like their uh, missing leg being massaged and this is going to help significantly with psychological pain and it seems to decrease physical pain and then the patient is taught to do it themselves which i feel like is huge for them to take their own pain into their own hands and process that. And I bet it's very emotional as well. Yeah, that's amazing. I would think too, the physical work would help with some of the contracture issues as well. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, no doubt. And the cool thing is these boxes are, it was saying it's co covered by, by many insurances as well. So that's dope. <laughs> 
it is. You know, back in the day when I started, even massage was so woo-woo. It wasn't considered a legitimate therapy. Yeah. I mean, now, it, just now we just, it's so obvious to all of us, but back then it was not. It was, <laughs> you were a second-class citizen if that's what you were doing. Yeah, I feel like some people, when they're, doctor prescribes for them to come see me they're like what do you mean and they're like no she will take care of this whatever it is and they just do not get it until they receive it and then they're like I can't believe I thought this was woo woo or this was just for fluff and buff and I'm like no this is yeah. real deal baby yes yes well and I think too it all comes back to good client teaching right we just need to educate people and definitely yeah, that's, yeah, because who else is going to do that? Right. Yeah. Pretty cool. Well, our last thing is um, virtual massage. You can um, have virtual goggles set up and then you will have imagery of your limbs being massaged and that can help with people with psychological and emotional and physical pain. That is fascinating. Thank you so much. That is just amazing. Wow. There's all kinds of, do you have any idea what the efficacy is? Like, do you have any statistics? Do you know what the um, success rate is? Has anybody tracked that? I couldn't find anything, um, but okay. just in my own personal experience, eventually my clients were fine and they didn't need to see me anymore. All of them with their phantom pain. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of them, were able to reduce their medication intake significantly as well, which was the main mm. main track. <laughs> we were trying to get them off all of those meds, and uh, sure. yeah, they got their prosthetics. And I, from what I know, they're all doing great. All right, that is really exciting. All right, who's next? I want to compare some of these drugs now to some of this alternative stuff. Oh, I was going to say, I can talk about the transcutaneous electrical nerve. Okay. It's not a med. No, it's another good alternative. I'm all about the alternative. I love the TENS machine. All right, do TEP. So the transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, um, they essentially place like electrodes uh, near the affected area. And it sends like an electrical current like through your body. And I mean, our, our nerves communicate with electricity. So um, it helps like destimulate the pain um, or it can also like kind of overstimulate the nerves so that we don't feel that pain. Mm -hmm. um, but, and, and you can place the tens like near the, near the stump or near the phantom limb and it can kind of relieve some of that perceived pain that they feel. Um, it, it does have a few contraindications, like you don't want to do it if you have any kind of implantable device, cancer, pregnancy, history of epilepsy. Um, but I remember my, my, my grandma used to, she had, it wasn't um, electrodes like this, but it was like a mat that she would like lay down uh, like over her chair and be like, grandma, like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm sitting in my electric chair. And like, I was too young at the time to understand what was going on, but I think this is what she was using. That, yes, they do have it in that, in that type of format, or they did. I don't know if they still do, but I remember those for sure. Okay, so this again is a pretty non-invasive. Do we, did you have any statistics on the efficacy of this? Do we know how successful this is? Uh, no, we just know that it's like non-invasive and pretty safe and a lot of, a lot of people can use it. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. What, what do we got next? I can go over the calcitonin. We kind of had a struggle with this one, if I'm being honest. So um, we felt like we couldn't really find a whole lot of like backed up studies. Like the one article I found um, said that there was only like three studies that really concentrated on this. 
Um, so it's not fully understood like what it does or how how it helps. Um, so there's a bunch. Of, there's there's um, four postulated mechanisms um, um, about endorphins um, that can help with pain control, um, or it lessens like the pain signal at the spinal cord that helps um, helps lessen that pain signaling. Um, or like the prostaglandins that can lessen, it can lessen the local chemical irritation of the sensory nerve that has been, in, that had been injured, um, or it modulates the calcium channels, um, the voltage that way the action potential won't be generated um, as easily, it'll become more difficult. So that should lessen the intensity. Um, and then um, it, how it works with uh, phantom limb pain, Again, it was kind of hard to find anything, um, but it targets um, the pain generators that is associated with phantom limb pain. Um, if you use it earlier on, it has a better response. Um, and it like it could be with the endorphins um, and the prostaglandin gland kind of lessen that pain. Um, and then um, these medications can be given a Q or um, intranasally, I think is the more common way, um, or IM. No, sorry, we didn't, we, we couldn't find a whole lot on this one. Well, yeah, because I think there is not a lot of, you know, and this is the thing about drugs a lot of times that, you know, if you look in drug books and you look at mechanism of action, a lot of times that's what it says. Not fully understood, but we think it does this, that, and the other. And there's not a lot of studies. I found one at NIH that talked about this particular drug, but there's not. There's just not a lot out there. Did you find any um, efficacy kind of? No. I didn't see any. My group members, I don't know if they did, but I don't think we saw anything. Is there a downside to doing this? Like, are there side effects and other issues that, that would kind of make it where you wouldn't want to do this? I didn't see anything. Okay. And that would be the number one thing when you're looking at drugs. The very first thing is what's the downside to this, right? That because that's always the the juggle with drugs is okay, if I give this drug, I know it's going to do this, but it's also going to do this. So is it worth it? Right? That's what it always comes down to with drugs. All right. Thank you very much. Who's next? Tell us about some more drugs here. Oh, well, we can do heat. Oh, heat. I forgot we had another one. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we didn't find a whole bunch on this either. I don't know if we were just not looking in the right spot, but um, so we found that heat, it can vasodilate and help decrease pain cramps and make the muscles in the surrounding area um, just a little more relaxed, not so tensed up in that um, amputated whatever part of the body. Mm -hmm. um, and heat can also promote tissue healing. Um, we found out that it causes more of like a soothing effect over anything. Um, just to provide comfort to the patient. And you do need to limit like the duration that you have direct heat applied to an amputated limb, typically no more than 20 minutes um, because you can have potential risk for a burn or tissue injury, especially if you're using like a heating pad or something electric to do it. Um, they recommended like lots of warm blankets and stuff for patients that um, are wanting like heat stimulation. And yeah, that's, pretty much what we found on it. That's a pretty good rule of thumb for both heat and ice, 20 minutes and stop. Mm -hmm. you know, and because also the after 20 minutes, the body's response and the tissue response begins to change, right? So mm -hmm. 20 minutes and you've lost that optimum response. And sometimes that can go in the other direction. So, yeah. okay, thank you. Were there any contraindications to putting heat on that stone? Did you see anything about that? Um, just to not leave it on for a long period of time, but nothing really in specific. It didn't seem that there was a lot of um, information on it that it was like very effective in any other way besides soothing. And so I don't know if it really does more than just like a 
like a mental thing for the patient. Mm -hmm. okay. But no, I didn't see any contraindication towards that. Okay. Next. I think we only have what? One or two left? One? No. We can do antispasmodics. Okay, so fabulous. Yeah. Um, so we had, it's similar to muscle relaxants and anticholinergics. Like that's what you're finding when you're looking it up. So it can affect both the CNS and the PNS to depress hyperactive spasticity of muscles. Um, and then also some examples are baclofen, dicyclamine, diazepam, dantrolene, oxybutynine, and bethanicol. And... Um, how and why does it work with phantom limb pain? We found that it acts on the CNS by mim mimicking or enhancing the GABA effect. Um, doing this causes sedative effects and muscle spasticity depression. Some of the phantom limb pain is related to the muscles, which translates to the cramping pain. So relaxing that effect can relieve the pain. And that's all we could find. It was kind of hard. There wasn't much. So. Okay. All right, but that would make sense because that's, you know, the the spasming can be unbelievable. I mean, even in um, uh, people with spinal cord injury, the spasming is just unbelievable. So I could definitely see where that would help. All right, thank you. Who's next? I can talk about um, our group. We had anti-epileptics. Um, we also, it was number three, so it's more up, but, oh wait, just kidding, it's right there. So we couldn't find a ton on this either, um, but basically what it does is it relieves the sharp and stabbing and burning pain that can be felt, so like the nerve pain, and so this is why it would help with uh, phantom limb pain, because it helps to quit all of that pain um, by suppressing like those nerve sig signals that would be um going to the brain to like disrupt that um and then i was just looking for like any other things um and it, i guess research says that it's suggested to try other sort of like pain relieving measures before you do anti-epileptics but then there's others that say that long-term anti-epileptics have less like long-term side effects and so it kind of doesn't that's like interesting yeah and surprising <laughs> too really i know yeah i mean that's affecting all the electrical i mean how how electrically right. active the brain and if we're going to kind of kind of tamp it down you'd think there would be some other issues there. right <laughs> yeah so that's that's what i found doesn't seem like there's a ton because i mean it's used mainly for to prevent seizures but it does help with that sharp and stabbing and burning pain that you would feel with phantom wound pain so is it commonly used? Like, is this sort of a something you would expect to see, or is this? Uh, I'm not sure. Just because with like what I read, it says that typically some doctors aren't like it's not like the first to go to as far as um, trying to eliminate that pain. Like, it's recommended to try other like sources to relieve pain than that. But okay. I, I didn't find too much else on it, honestly. Okay. Great, thank you so much. So that leaves us with beta blockers. Yeah, I can do that one. Okay, well, um, beta blockers for everything. How how <laughs> how does that work out with this? I know I was almost kind of expecting more, but basically, um, the main thing that beta blockers do is like slows down your heart rate, it dilates your blood vessels, um, and so we were thinking maybe um, because they help vasodilate the vasculature of the body it can go to that affected limb but we weren't able to really connect that with affecting the nerves at all and there was really no evidence that supported that they really help phantom limb pain at all but some of them there was like some studies that had been done and really nothing was conclusive i think they just wanted I don't know. I remember, I think it was Ethan in our group was like, it, they kind of just at this point are like throwing the kitchen sink at it. Like here, try all of these medications and really. And I think that know. really, there is, there's definitely that component for sure. I would say that, um, you know, just taking a guess at the path though here, because we are getting that vasodilation and we're getting, you know, more 
oxygenated blood and nutrients to that general area because remember that in cases of neuropathy, say, um, from people who have peripheral arterial disease. So that tissue down there is just getting deprived of oxygen, nutrients, and over time, um, the nerves are also damaged too. And so that then you get that horrible burning pain. There's nothing like nerve pain. It is burning pain. So maybe that is part of what that rationale is. Yeah, so totally could be. <laughs> okay, so here's what I found. While you guys were doing that, I was kind of looking at, at the latest research also. And um, well, somewhere. I went to my, one of my go-to places is NIH. If I want to know anything, I go to NIH. And what I found was in a lot of the drugs that we've talked about today, the, the, the bottom line is that the trials, the clinical trials have been pretty small overall and that the results were, were varied. Like there was no consistent result. It worked in some people. It didn't work in other people. It worked early or it worked late or it didn't work. So I think a lot of what you guys have been saying that, oh, I can't find, there's not a lot of research out there. And I think that's because there isn't a lot of research out there. So, and what there is, isn't really conclusive at all from what I'm seeing. And then I also went to Cleveland Clinic, another one of my places I like to go to. And I, that's where I was looking up the mirror therapy. And that has changed. And I thought that was fascinating. What, who was my um, massage therapist? I oh, yeah. that was me. <laughs> that was, yes, Eden. It, that, that is so interesting about, you know, because before it was about tricking the brain or convincing the brain that if that limb isn't there, you don't have any pain, right? But now the whole notion of tricking the brain into, yeah, we've still got a leg and it's a good one. No problems here. And I thought, how, how smart is that? That's the wonderful thing about evidence-based practice is, you know, things are, there's always research being done and it's always evolving and we're just learning new and better ways to, um, to do things. So my takeaway from all this is that it would appear, and we don't have any hard data to support that, but it would appear that the non-pharmacological non interventions would probably seem to be maybe, if not the most effective, certainly the ones that are less likely to have any side effects and things happening. So, you know, there these things are becoming more legitimatized and are moving into hospitals more and more. I remember one time I was working um, on our unit and we had a woman that had, she was a pretty young woman. Younger people have, have much more pain than older people. Um, and she had a lung surgery and she had a chest tube in. And sometimes those chest tubes, man, can lay on a nerve, right? And they're just, you can't get comfortable. It doesn't matter which way you move. And I had loaded her up with pain with all the opioids. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, this just didn't work. And she was crying. It was horrible. So I went in, I asked the family to step out. I closed the door and I said, do you know anything about energy work? And she said, no. And I said, okay, well, can I try something with you? And she was desperate. She said, yes, anything. And I said, okay, well, you just lay there and close your eyes and relax. And, you know, I'm going to be kind of, waving my hands around, doing some stuff. And she said, okay. So I just started doing some energy work on her. And within 10 minutes, she was asleep. It just completely removed that pain. And I came back in about 30 minutes later, she was sitting up with her family, talking, laughing, no pain. So, you know, there, there are so many better ways to do things. And we are so married to pharmacology. And I think as nurses, we are the one segment because, you know, farm, farm companies and while pharmacology has a place, I'm not saying we should stop doing farm, but I am saying that we've kind of turned it into the be all end all. And it's the first thing we go to. 
And drugs today are so much more dangerous than they used to be. And I think it's worth exploring those alternative options. And let me say one more thing, because I know we're past break time here. On this cardiac unit I worked at, Dr. Oz, you know Dr. Oz, who's become a little bit of a crazy person, but before that, he was a very well-respected cardiovascular surgeon in, um, oh shoot, what was the hospital? I want to say Columbia Presbyterian, anyway, in New York. And he was on their open heart surgical unit. And what they did, they got a trial study. So he got a bunch of money and they did guided imagery. So people before and after cardiac surgery, they did guided imagery. They did meditation. They taught them yoga. They did um, dietary kind of supports. And what they found at the end of this is that people who did this, so they had people who did, and then they had the control group that did the traditional thing. And what they found is the group that was doing all the alternative stuff needed far less pain medication afterwards. They healed faster. They were discharged home sooner. They had fewer complications. And when they followed up with them six months afterwards, they were still actually doing all the things they learned how to do. They were using those techniques. And I thought, how wonderful is that? So I wanted to start that on our cardiac floor in the hospital I worked on. So I went to the cardiovascular surgeons and I said, you know, I want to do this. What, what, and the first thing he said to me, he said, great, I love it. How are you going to fund it? And so I called back up to Columbia Presbyterian and talked to Dr. Oz's team. And they said, yeah, when the grant money ran out, as successful as that program was, they would no longer support it financially. And so they had eight people on staff. They had seven people out fundraising to support one practitioner. Me, it's like, okay, I'm not a fundraiser. I don't want to do that. If that, if it, if, if, so the whole thing kind of fell apart because of the money. But I think as a group, collectively as nurses, we need to go, we need to, you know, encourage other things, right? And, and who else better to do it than us? All right, let's take Tim.
Hang on, I've lost our, <laughs> I've lost the PowerPoint. Here we go. Okay. We're in the home stretch, guys. Hang in there. Okay, so what are we looking at when we suspect someone has a problem or just as part of our assessment? And that is going to be posture off the top. So that's part of our general survey. And here you see some examples of problems with posture. Kyphosis, you can see this is just very pronounced here. Lordosis, pronounced here, and scoliosis. We've just got a curve in that spine. We're going to also be looking at gait. How are they? How are they ambulating? Range of motion for joints. Check muscle strength and size. So, you know, when you're doing your assessment, you say, squeeze my hands, squeeze them hard. On their feet, we'll say, I'll put my hands up and say, push, push your feet against my hands as hard as you can. So again, just ways that we're assessing muscle strength. We're going to look at skin. And neurovascular status. So clonus is um, an involuntary rhythmic muscular contraction, and it's usually caused by a lesion, a permanent lesion, somewhere in that descending, in that descending motor neuron. And that is tremendously uncomfortable. All right, let's look at osteoporosis. This is out of all of the um, musculoskeletal. This is, put this on your must know list because this you'll see on NCLEX. So osteoporosis is just low bone density. So the bones lose their strength. And here you can just see what normal bone looks like, the, the fabric of normal bone, osteoporosis. Penia, so penia is not enough. Osteo bone, so we're not making enough bone here. Then we have osteoporosis and severe osteoporosis. So now you can start to see that our, our open areas are, are getting bigger and the actual structure is kind of getting thinner. So that's a problem. So expected find. Reduced height, particularly postmenopausal, because there is an estrogen um, calcium connection there. I will tell you something that I found. I created a um, healthcare program for a small manufacturing company, and I administered that for, oh, gosh, I don't know, 10 years. And every year I would, you know, do a whole set of vitals and I would. Uh, Measure, measure their height. And what we discovered is after the first year, when we came back and did vitals again, some of them, well, a lot of them got taller. <laughs> so but like by a quarter or half an inch, which was significant. And they were all like, oh, I'm growing. Oh, no, actually not. But part of what happens is, you know, when you get underhydrated particularly you get that you get that spinal compression and so what happened is when they started improving their hydration status and their nutrition their spines started to elongate again and they got taller so they were all very excited about that um acute back pain after lifting and bending a history of fractures kyphosis we saw and pain upon palpitation palpation over the affected area. Okay, these would be expected findings in someone with osteoporosis. All right. Uh, so fracture risk assessment tool. So age, of course, it's, it, it, your risk for osteoporosis increases with age. Gender, Women are more affected than men, and that again is probably that estrogen connection there. Um, let's see all of these. I'm going to pick out the 
really big one, smoker. Smoking, I don't understand why anyone does it. It is, it damages every cell in the body. And this is no different. Corticosteroids. So this would be something you would be asking about because over time, you know, if someone is on a corticosteroid, that's going to really impact bone density. And think about people with COPD, right? These might be people that we've got on, on prednisone long-term. So there definitely are some downsides to certainly the long-term use of this. A history of rheumatoid arthritis, alcohol. Okay. And then these also put people at risk. So let's look at what labs we would need. We touched on that a little earlier. Calcium, of course, top, top of the line. Vitamin D, because calcium can't be absorbed without adequate vitamin D. And it's not just a matter of having it in there. Again, the body's got to be able to use it or it doesn't count. So vitamin D really, people should be getting some, some sunlight to metabolize and, and help with that vitamin D. Phosphorus is a nut now. Phosphorus, remember I was talking about certain um, minerals and electrolytes work in teams. They got a buddy. So uh, calcium has two buddies, but for bone, phosphorus is their pal. And what happens is together, the two of them manage bone integrity. Here's what you really need to remember when we're talking about calcium and phosphorus is that they are inversely related to each other. So when one is high, the other is low and it goes back and forth. Now, remember when we're talking about hypo or hyper anything, we're talking about in the blood, emia, hypercalcemia, hyperphosphatemia. So we're always talking about in the blood. But calcium and phosphorus work with the bone. So what happens is they both flux into the bone. So if you have high calcium in the blood, then you'll have phosphorus move into the bone and that will lower the phosphorus level in the blood and vice versa. So I just want you to recognize that connection there because if one is high, the other is low. So as the nurse, you need to be thinking, you can't just focus on one. You need to remember that, okay, if I've got this, I've also got this. Um, a 24-hour urine is very typical as a diagnostic um, that will allow us to see what they're getting rid of, what they're holding on to. Imaging, we already talked about. Okay, interventions. I really want to focus on, and I don't know about you guys, but I know in my class, I'm seeing a struggle in, um, in the nursing part of things, right? It seems like we've got the medical part down. <laughs> we somehow skipped over the nursing part. So really make sure you're focusing on what will you as the nurse do that you don't need an order for, right? Because remember, your, your job is to manage care. So obviously we're gonna need some dietary changes if they are don't have enough calcium. So they would need to increase their calcium intake and their vitamin D intake. And remember, we talked about that malabsorption issue. So if you're doing an assessment and you're saying, well, you know, we need to increase your calcium or your vitamin D. And they're like, no, I'm already taking supplements. All right. Well, now you have to, now you have to think, okay, wait a minute. Two things that come to mind. How good is your supplement? Because there's a lot of garbage out there. And two, if you're taking a supplement, gee, you should, you should have higher lab levels. So now what's going on there? And the next thing I'd be asking, I'd be assessing for any kind of malabsorption issue, right? So remember that your job is to find the problem, solve the problem. All right. Limiting caffeine, alcohol, carbonation, all of that. We need protein, magnesium, vitamin K, our adjuncts to bone formation. We need to be in the sun because we can't activate vitamin D without some sunshine. Weight-bearing exercises. People need to be upright on their feet. People that are sedentary sitting in a chair all the time, it's a problem. This is why um, anyone that is on prolonged bed rest 
and people that have paralysis are confined to a wheelchair, bones will start to thin very quickly. So for people that um, have been paralyzed for any length of time, if for some, if, if we found a cure for that and they could just get up and start walking, that would be a problem because their bones would no longer support them. So definitely need to encourage weight-bearing exercise, home safety, you know, the usual things, right? Slippery surfaces, um, throw rugs, all those kind of things. So if we have somebody that we know their bones aren't as strong as they should be, then we know they're not gonna do well if they fall down on things. <laughs> we need to be looking around saying, okay, how can we prevent that? Um, and then of course there, you know, we want just no clutter, right? No, no clutter. <laughs> and if you've got kids, no bicycles or skates or toys left laying around or on the sidewalk, right? We need to make sure there are clear pathways. Medications are gonna serve a couple of purposes. They're going to decrease bone resorption. They're gonna stimulate bone formation. We're going to replace estrogen because we need estrogen. When women go through menopause, that estrogen level falls significantly and that impacts bone density. And um, calcium and vitamin D supplements. Now. Here are vitamin D foods and calcium rich foods. Let me tell you, if it doesn't come up on a class exam, I guarantee you, hear me, guarantee you, this will be on NCLEX. And you're going to get questions asking you, telling you, you have a patient with hypocalcemia or hypercalcemia or osteoporosis or whatever. And you, what would you advise the client to increase or decrease in their diet? So you need to know calcium rich foods and, vit and foods that are high in vitamin D, okay? So work nutrition into your study life. As you go through every dis disease process and disorder, always think about what's missing or what do we need more of or what do we need to stay away from? Like in heart failure, we avoid sodium at all costs, right? So same thing, and we want potassium if we're on certain medications, we want to put some nutrients back. So always be thinking about that and just put it into your notes because I guarantee you NCLEX will be full of that kind of stuff. All right. Trauma is just what it sounds like. So this can be serious or mild or significant um, strains usually just overstretching or moving the wrong way, sprain, ligaments and tendons, twisting, hyperextension, those are typical. And what are we going to do? Nursing management, what are nurses gonna do? And we're back to price, right? Prevention, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Again, that's just a concept you can apply again and again to everything. All right, joints also get dislocated. So now things are no longer lined up the way they should be. Um, painful for sure. So we're gonna do analgesia of some description. Um, immobilize it to prevent further damage. Muscle relaxants can be helpful. And then again, your assessment, those six Ps. So remember those and what can go wrong. The biggest thing that can go wrong when joints get dislocated is we disrupt blood flow. And again, you know, tissue can only go so long without oxygen and nutrients. And then we start getting necrosis. So avascular, avascular. So vascular is blood flow. A or an before something means no, not without. Think of sepsis, sepsis, asepsis, right? Vascular, avascular. So it's gonna end up with some bone death here. Carpal tunnel. Well, I tell you, I saw a lot of that. As I just said, I created a, an employee healthcare program for a small manufacturing company and they, they made furniture by hand. 
So there was a lot of repetitive motion with the hands, a lot of repetitive motion. Carpal tunnel was a huge big deal right across that employee population. And it generally happens in the wrist. And this, this picture here is, the, um, is one of the diagnostics. It's one of the ways that you can tell if you have it or not. If you, if you can't do this or it is excruciatingly painful, <laughs> that, might be, that might be an indicator. So um, you can immobilize it with some sort of a sprint or brace. And sense for pain. And as that progresses and gets worse, is corticosteroid shots. And that can happen three times. They have to be spaced well apart, six months. Um, you know, the there's a trade-off to everything. And the problem with the corticosteroids are powerful anti-inflammatory, which is great. If <laughs> you reduce the inflammation, you're gonna reduce the pain and get a little bit of mobility back. But Generally, corticosteroid injections um, make it where it also inhibits any kind of natural healing that might occur. And then surgery is going to be what you end up with as that progresses. So post-surgical, if they've got to have surgery, you're going to elevate the hands above the heart. Right? We've already talked about this a couple of times today. We want to keep all that fluid from building up in the area we just did surgery on because that will inhibit healing of that tissue and can cause additional damage there. We are going to be doing neurovascular status Q1 hour immediately after surgery. So capillary refill, can we wiggle our fingers? Can you feel this? What's the temperature? What's the color? You know the, 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 you know the drill, right? And um, then we're going to have them after that, we're going to have them reduce that um, wrist movement after surgery for at least four to six weeks, because you've got to give that time to heal, that tissue time to heal. All right, fractures. Oh, we need to talk about fractures and you need to know the classifications of fractures. So open or closed is just what it sounds like, open, breaks the skin, closed, does not. Um, so what you're seeing on the picture is definitely an, an open <laughs> fracture. And then you have displaced. And all that means is if the bone broke, are they still lined up? They may not, they may not be joined together anymore. They may be broken, but are they still in alignment? So if it is a non-displaced fracture, then your bones are still in alignment. That's good because, you know, that gives you a step up. If they're not in alignment, if they look something like this, then you, <laughs> you're going to need some surgery and they're going to have to put a rod and pin in here and line those things back up and get them together again. I know this from personal experience. Oh, wrong one. So here we have all these many different types of um, fractures. And know the um, term, of, okay. I gotta, I keep moving your pictures around so I can see the, right, the writing behind it. No, no, these, these are just must know um, for a test. Um, so avulsion is the tendon or ligaments pull off. So remember that how, how, how bones move, right? Is that there is some ligament and tendon wrapped around the, the um, bone and then they attach to the muscle. So now when the muscle moves, that pulls the tendon and the bone moves. And then when you release, so what happens is that muscle gets, as you tense it, that muscle shortens up. And as it does, it pulls 
it pulls that bone forward. And then the exact same thing happens opposite on extension. As you relax it, that, that muscle lengthens and it puts less pressure on the tendons and ligaments, which are hooked up to the bone, and then the bone moves in the other direction. So in emulsion, hmm, we lost a tendon or, or a ligament. So obviously that's going to that's gonna create some problems in movement. Uh, comminuated, comminuted, I'm sorry, comminuted, and that is misspelled, is, is the, it wasn't a clean break, it's fragmented, all right? Green stick, you'll often hear about, and that means it, that start, it fractured on one side of the bone, but it didn't go all the way through, and so it's not fractured on the other side of the bone. Then we have impacted here, and that's where the fractured bone is wedged inside of the, okay, <laughs> let's try that again. We, we fractured it, so they're not attached anymore, but what happened is one of these is now pushed into the other one. Still broken, but impacted. Where's oblique? Oblique is that sort of sideways kind of angled break. Spiral. Okay, you're going to hear this in peds a lot. Babies with spiral fractures, 100% of the time is from abuse. So it's from a twisting motion. And transverse, which is just breaks all the way through. Nice flat across the horizon break. All right. Green stick happens a lot in kids. So let's take a look at a few more of these. So that's open. So here we can see that these bones are not lined up, right? So would that be displaced or not displaced? Displaced. displaced. Which one? Displaced. Displaced, yep. They are not lined up. All right. Um, I can't see. I can't see this well enough to know what it is. Skipping that one. What does this look like? Closed. Closed. Mm -hmm. What else? Non-displaced, oblique. Oblique. Mm -hmm. Yep, I like it. And what about this one over here? I'm guessing closed because we can't see the picture of the skin. Definitely closed. Yep. Is it common, common, comminuted? Sorry, because it looks like there's fragments. Um, it does kind of look like there's fragments there, doesn't it? Which would be the hallmark of comminuted. So it's iffy between transverse and comminuted. Um, well, transverse is going to be straight across. And you can see here we've got an angle. So transverse is a clean horizontal. So this would more likely be oblique, but it does look like it has some, some fractures in there, some, some broken pieces in there. Oh, here we go. Oh, well, it tells us. So all of these are open, displaced emulsion. Okay. So that fits with what we said, right? The tendons are off. Tendons are off. They're not, they're disconnected and they're not lined up. Okay. And they're open. Oh, I don't know. This one doesn't look open to me. This one maybe gets awfully close. That one you can tell. This one hard to tell. These are all closed. 
Do we have another one here? Well, there we go. It is comminuted. Yep. All right. So osteoporosis is going to be the big risk factor here. Um, and then just uh, trauma, falls, car wrecks, anything like that, any hazardous activity. And then the other things that you're seeing here are just things that are going to lead to osteoporosis. So what you would expect to find is pain, decreased range of motion, possibly crepitus, because air can, can get under that, that skin. There may be a deformity, so the um, whatever, whatever limb or whatever it is is not looking natural. It's twisted in an unnatural way. Definitely going to be muscle spasming, edema, and ecchymosis for sure. Diagnostics, we're going to take a picture. So x-ray, CT, MRI, maybe a bone scan. Nursing interventions. So my sister got um, osteoporosis when she was pregnant. And um, the only reason why they figured it out is because she was in so much pain and she just couldn't walk. And she actually had fractured her hip from it. Ah. So, so she couldn't hold her baby. She couldn't walk with her baby for like two months. And she had to be in a wheelchair ah. while it healed. <laughs> oh. Is she a small, boned, thin white woman? She is. Yeah, they're the, they're, they're the most at risk for osteoporosis. Wow, that's amazing. And so up until that time, she didn't, she had no idea because I'm sure she wasn't fine up until that point and then that happened. No, and it was just during her pregnancy. Now that she wasn't pregnant anymore, it went away, so. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. Okay, what are we gonna do in trauma? Well, trauma is trauma, so we're always gonna maintain airway. We're definitely gonna do vital signs and neurovascular checks, stabilize the injured area, try to keep them lined up if you can. Not always possible, but try to. Gonna to elevate the limb above the heart so that we don't pump a whole bunch more fluid down in there, especially if we've got any severed um, arteries or veins. I had a little incident at one point and I, I was on the ground and I couldn't find my arm and I'm looking around and it was laying down the middle of my back. So I got up and it, it flung around and it, it went back in and then it hit me in the chest and it ran around and hit me in the back. So I was trying to catch my arm. And by the time the medics got there, it was the size of a basketball. So anytime you've got trauma, broken bones, be thinking vascular as well, because that sometimes happens. So apply ice, assess for bleeding, and apply pressure, cover open wounds, um, remove really everything near the site of injury, keep the patient warm, um, neurovascular checks before, during, and after, the fix, whether that's a cast or some sort of fixation. I cannot overemphasize the importance of ongoing neurovascular checks. Just because they're fine ones doesn't mean they're going to continue to be fine. Uh, we're going to do pain management, muscle relaxants, and possibly antibiotics. All right. Is it? We are just so behind here. All right. We're going next. Oops. All right. We're going to look at how we're going to immobilize these things and then what are we going to do. So, um, splints, various types of splints can do immobilization. Casts, that'll, that'll keep you from moving it around. We're going to talk about traction, which uses weights. External fixation, which is when the hardware is on the outside of the body. Internal fixation is when the body, the hardware is on the inside, closed reduction. So we're going to manipulate that from the outside to realign displaced bone fragments and open reduction, which is going to realign 
the displaced bone fragments. So the most common surgery you're going to see is referred to as an ORIF, which is open reduction internal fixation. Most common one that you'll see. All right, splints. Again, anytime we are putting anything on somebody, we need to make sure that we've got good uh, circulation, make sure that we've got good skin integrity. Um, and this may be something you do temporarily until we get to the real fix, or this might be all that's needed. That's going to vary definitely from person, from injury to injury. So casts, they are going to immobilize motion and they can be short, long, walking, all body cast. Oh, this person here has a body cast. Can you imagine anything more horrible than that? Um, they can be plaster, plastic, and fiberglass. Most of the time, most of the time, they're going to be fiberglass. That's like the go-to for casts right now. NCLEX questions are going to also, may not be on your exam, I don't know, but definitely on the NCLEX, I can tell you, you will see questions about plaster casts. So how are you going to dry it? Can you touch it? Can you move it around? So when, in your, when you're doing your review, look at the difference between fiberglass and plastic. We're going to do them a little bit differently. Uh, make sure the cast isn't too tight. You should be able to get a finger up underneath between the skin and the cast. There's got to be room in there. Important than anything, don't stick anything down in the cast because that skin, think about it, that skin is, it's going to be warm hot under that cast. You're going to be sweaty. That tissue is going to become very fragile. And as it heals, it's going to itch like mad. And people grab all kinds of things and start sticking it down in there and scratching. And that is such a high risk for infection. So really needs to do very good client teaching. Um, cool air will help with the itching and tapping on the cast, but no sticking anything down in there. You wanna cover the cast with something waterproof. So it is fine. Um, just when you're showering, don't wanna get it wet. We want to assess for and have the client report increased pain and if there are hot spots on the cast. So that may just be, you know, the big complication here is, is there's going to be pressure and that's going to create skin breakdown. All right. And shortness of breath. Hmm. Why would be, why would, why are we talking about shortness of breath? Any thoughts on that? Is that Pulmonary embolism. Yes. Yeah. So any kind of ortho issue, pretty high risk for clots. So, and and not even just um, vascular clots, but fat. Remember, inside bone, right? When we start breaking bones up, fat can be released, and you get you can get a fat embolism. All right, traction is where we're gonna hang weights off something to, to align, to pull and align tissue. Um, so most important thing for you to know, you can see here, we've got weight hanging off and it's attached to the cast or whatever he has on here. And this is called Buck's Traction. You see all the different kinds of versions of this, but basically, you're gonna have the weights hanging off. Weights must hang free and clear of the bed. You have to be careful, particularly um, with spinal cord injuries, they get on those braces and they're off the head of the bed. You gotta make sure that those weights are not caught between the head of the bed and the wall. So they all weights like that must hang freely. And 
They're going to realign those bone fragments, decrease muscle spasms and pain, and hopefully uh, prevent any further issues. So there are different types of traction. Skin is short term, and which all of these are. And you can see where they're just going to run a pin straight through and then support that. And skeletal are, are balanced. This is a very typical Bucks traction here. So you can see they've got the brace and they've got all the weights hanging and the weights are all hanging free. So that would be part of your assessment. So neurovascular, maintain body alignment, leave the weights alone, make sure they're hanging free. We're looking for skin integrity and you really got to assess the pins because these are embedded in the client. So we're looking for any signs of infection. And because it is invasive, we're going to do pin site care, just like we would for a um, central line, right? When you got something going in the body, we gotta, we gotta maintain that site. So chlorhexidine is usually the go-to. Okay, what are we doing here? External fixation. So you can see here, the hardware is on the outside on this one. So this would be for comminuted fractures, some congenital defects. So early on in life, they can re, because, you know, children's bones are very soft and malleable. And so if they come out and they are not formed correctly, they can be taught to grow correctly. Um, again, are you seeing a pattern here? Neurovascular status. <laughs> it's the one thing you're always going to do. We're going to elevate the extremity, pin care, signs and septum, uh, symptoms of infection, and aseptic cleansing. I mean, that just is for that's just really standard. So that shouldn't be a, a brain drain for you. All right, what can go wrong? Compartment syndrome. And what happens is that there, there, there is so much pressure building up in, in one area that blood flow is basically cut off. So we're not getting perfusion. And you know what happens when we don't get perfusion. So ischemia, tissue damage can happen, start happening in four to six hours. So it's got, as soon as there's any in, uh, what am I trying to say? Any indicator for compartment syndrome, you got to jump on that. So you will, patient may complain of just pain that, that doesn't make sense, pain that they shouldn't be having. And that would be an indicator to start doing a deeper assessment for that. Um, medical intervention or cast or cat. <laughs> okay, now I'm starting to lose the ability to form speech. We will remove the cast or the splint or whatever it is they have on because very often it's, it's just too tight or there's so much swelling of the extremity that it may not have been tight when they put it on, but now it got too tight. So. They may want to just take that completely off. They try not to do that. That wouldn't be the go-to thing. What they try to do is adjust it somehow, maybe cut the cast a little, try to try to get a little bit of extra room in there. But if not, cast got to come off. Emergency fasciotomy. And this is exactly what you're seeing right here. Um, and they're just going to open it up and let that drain and get some blood flow back in there. So would you like to guess what all we're going to do here? Hang on. Nursing management. What are we going to do? Neurovascular checks, right? Again, the six Ps. And if you see anything, anything at all that does not look right, that you need to, to contact the provider immediately because this is a serious complication. Fat embolism, which is what I just talked about. Fat cells get released from the bone and that can end up in the lung and then you end up with a PE. So this is no different than 
any other, you know, clot situation, right? So usually going to happen within 12 to 48 hours of the injury or the surgery. Um, respiratory failure makes sense, right? And then uh, restlessness, the very first sign of hypoxia. And then afterwards, you'll start to see a petechial rash, the white sputum. So prevention is immobilize the fracture. The, the less moving around, the less you have to worry about that. Early surgical intervention, they need to get in there and get that fixed as soon as possible. And then adequate support for the fracture anytime you're having to, to move people around. All right, so think fat embolism and PE. If you know PE, then, you know, it's no, no different than any other PE. Okay, osteomyelitis is an infection of the bone. It is a huge problem. Uh, you will see pain and swelling. There may be, you start to see skin ulcerations because what's happening is the infection is now in the bone and starting to work its way out. So that infection is going to start. Normally, we see infections start on the outside and work their way in. In osteomyelitis, you kind of flip that script a little bit. So you will definitely see it on x-ray. And then it's an infection. So we're going to be looking at all the same labs we would be looking for for other infections, you know, high white blood count, the um, uh, sedimentation rate. X-ray, MRI, and bone scans. And then the treatment is going to be antibiotics, and they're going to be on them for quite a while, several months for sure. Very difficult to get to pain management. It is super painful, so analgesia. Uh, they're probably going to need surgical debridement and probably more than once. So that's going to mean a few trips to the OR to get that cleaned out periodically. Um, Sometimes they will implant beads of antibiotic directly in the wound. Because remember I said, it's not a very vascular site. So very difficult if you're giving systemic drugs, difficult to get that to the bone. So sometimes what they'll do is they'll take beads of antibiotic and implant it right into that wound, right into the bone itself. Uh, worst case scenario, amputation, because... If this gets infected and you get gangrenous, it's got to come off. It's just, yeah. So again, nursing treatment. I don't know, neurovascular assessment. Again, those six Ps. This ought to be just like, and dressing changes are going to be the main nursing issues. Okay. Any questions about anything that we have talked about so far today? sharing, right? Yes. Okay. Zoom. Any questions about anything? I'm going to say um, we didn't talk about rheumatoid arthritis, um, but os and really didn't talk that much about osteoarthritis, did we? In which case, we're not even going to worry about it. Hang on. Let me just go back and look. Osteoporosis, not osteoarthritis. Okay, so that'll get covered in, in a different area. Just have a tiny little bit of time left. Let's. Oh, and if you want to, um, were you all able to download that Phantom Limb page? Yes, okay. Yeah, that I mean, you know, you can use that as a study tool, right? All right. Here's what I want to do. Let's oh, really. Let me try putting it on a different screen. Are there any foods that you suggest we know specifically that are like high in calcium and vitamin D? I would say green leafy vegetables, 
tend to be high. And um, I think sweet potatoes are right up there as well. And of course, you know, dairy products. The problem with dairy products is that they're not very absorbable, you know, and there's, there's, so, I mean, dairy product is going to be the go-to and probably on test questions, any kind of dairy product would be good. But um, from the food list, from the outside of dairy product, you might want to think about um, green leafy vegetables. They're, they're good for so many things. And I think yams too, sweet potatoes. But if you go and look at, um, I would say, well, I would say ATI is what I recommend and see what ATI is saying. And if it's not in your med surge ATI, go to the nutrition ATI ebook, right? You have access to all those because, um, you know, the majority of your tests are coming from ATI. So they're coming out of the ATI test bank. So try to align yourself with the information in ATI as much as you can, because that just makes good sense. That's who's where your tests are coming from. All right, I gotta close. All right. Let's talk about, <laughs> it did it again. All right, I have no control over this apparently. I do, I can show you the other one. I don't know why it splits the screen like that and I can't make it stop that because I'm, I'm technologically incompetent. What are you seeing? Are you seeing the split screen or are you seeing the, the full screen? It's good now. Okay. Okay. So 82 year old with a past medical history of dementia, coronary artery disease, hypertension, and diabetes slipped on a rug at home and fell fracturing his left hip. Cannot tell you how many times you're going to hear that in real life. In the ED, a head CT was negative for any bleeding. Uh, radiographs and CT scan of the pelvis and hips showed a left intertrochanteric hip fracture. EKG showed the patient to be in normal sinus rhythm without any signs of ischemia or infarction. Lab results revealed normal electrolytes, kidney function, and complete. What are the priority assessments here? What are you thinking? Stabilize the hip. Do what to the hip? Like stabilize it and get him ready for surgery. Okay. Uh, well, I, I agree you would do that, but that's an intervention, um, not an assessment. So what would your priority assessments be about? Would this be like the ABCs, like make sure his airway, his breathing, is perfusing blood? Um, yes, I guess I'm looking for a rationale for that, right? So what, what would, what would, what would um, be the, that? I don't know, it's just a safe nursing manager. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm here. So let's just look at what's going on here. Um, he fell. He's diabetic. He's hypertensive. He's got CAD. He's he's got dementia. What are any? And, and now he's got this busted up hip. What are we concerned about here? What it's are we so really? Awful. So what what are we going to be assessing for? First of all, first step in the process what are we going to be assessing for I would say mental because he has dementia so you'll want to make sure that I don't know these are the patients we get all the time okay 
his regular vital signs to try to get a baseline, but then also check his pain. He might not be able to say much about his pain, but we could watch his body language and see what type of pain he's in. Now you're cooking. That's what I'm, that's, that I think would be the priority. Now, in older people, older people do tend to be a little, I mean, I have known, it's unusual that someone like your sister would walk around with, with a broken bone like that. But I have known older people to walk around for a couple of weeks with a broken hip. And they come in and I'll say, didn't that hurt? And they'll say, oh, well, you know, it ached a little bit. But their pain is, they don't feel that pain nearly as acutely. But yes, I would be concerned about pain at this point. Because what effect is that going to have on blood pressure? going to increase it. Absolutely. And we've already got somebody that's hypertensive. And what does pain or stress do to blood sugar? Increases it. And we have a person here with diabetes, right? So I'm probably going to be assessing blood pressure. I'm going to be assessing blood sugar. And I, and I need to be doing something with this pain. And the fact that he has dementia, well, that just complicates things, doesn't it? So how would you know? If he was if he was painful, if he may or may not be able to really communicate that, what do you think? It'd be like wincing or guarding or like grimacing in his face. Absolutely. Or not letting us touch it or assess it. Yes, protecting it. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so I think those would be the priorities. Okay. So. He's going for surgery and we're going to fix the fracture. And it was initially scheduled for the next day, but it got delayed by three days due to several emergent trauma cases and lack of surgeon availability. And that was kind of what we were seeing in COVID too. These surgeries got pushed back. So while in the hospital, he was frequently agitated, disoriented and combated in the evening hours. All right. So what are we going to do? So we said pain was a significant issue because it was going to, because it was going to drive or add to the other issues that he's already got going on. So now we got three days, we got to hold him over. So what are we, what are we concerned about? And yes. notice he was not placed on VTE protocol. Sorry, go ahead, Lynn. Oh, uh, I mean, we're just worried about his safety at this point. He's going to injure himself even more. So he has, he has dementia and dementia patients don't listen. And so we usually have to have a sitter sit with them because they will try to get up and they might not even remember that they broke their hip. In fact, they don't remember a lot of times that they broke their hip. And so they, yeah. they have to go to the bathroom and they're jumping up and trying to get out of bed and they can just injure themselves more. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that would definitely be one of the big concerns. What about, what, about the, what about the pain issue? I mean, it was one thing that we were gonna manage his pain when he came in, but do we have any concerns about the fact we're gonna have to do this for three days now? What are we worried about? Lena, what are we worried about, girl? Uh, if we give, we give him too much pain medication, like we could depress his respiratory or CNR. <laughs> There's that. Yeah, absolutely. We're now we are definitely concerned about airway and and respiratory. And you know, with older people, and I've seen this so often that you give a drug and they're fine, and then you know, four to six hours later, you give it again and they're fine. Four to six hours, you give it again. And then they're unresponsive, right? And, and so always remember that, that older people don't have good kidney function. Now he had, he doesn't have kidney disease. It told us his kidneys were okay, but he's 82 years old. So there's okay. And then there's okay for an 82 year old. So what happens in older people is they cannot excrete that. So even though we're giving it every four hours in theory, after four hours, that has been excreted and left the body. But in older people, that isn't always the case. 
but they're painful again. So we give them more and then you get this additive effect. And then all of a sudden you go in and they're just completely unresponsive. So that's a huge concern. What are you thinking about this uh, not placed on VTE prophylaxis? Concern? No? Yeah, yeah, he's at risk for developing blood clots that would that could travel to the heart, brain, or lungs. Wouldn't go to the brain, but would definitely go to the lungs. So we'd be concerned about a PE because remember, we just talked about fat embolism. When you have a break in the bone, you've got fat coming out. And if, if this is happening and, and we've got him laying around for three days, and we haven't done something about that. He needs to, he, he really should be on some kind of, um, some kind of pain or uh, anticoagulation meds. So what would be an appropriate anticoagulant for him, do you think? Heparin. That works right away. It does. So, the thing to remember when we're talking about anticoagulation medication is slower or how much longer do we want it to be for him to make a clot, right? And that varies from person to person. So if you have someone with atrial fibrillation and they're making clots like crazy and it's a straight shot to the brain, well, that is... I mean that the 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 outcome is is pretty bad for that. So we want them probably two and a half to three and a half times slower at clot making than us. But and so that's that's where you start pulling in the big guns like heparin and coumadin. If it's just immobility right now with this broken bone. I would say Lovenox I would be the starter there. Um, I don't know that we need to get that as anticoagulated as all that because, um, you know, when you're on heparin or Coumadin, well, now we got all kinds of other problems we got to worry about, right? We got excessive bleeding. And let's think about this getting ready to go into surgery. right? He's going into surgery. So if we get him heavily anticoagulated, that's going to be a problem going into surgery, right? Because after we cut him open and do all that stuff, we're going to want him to make clots again. So, you know, that's, that's just you're going to have to weigh that. Normally, they probably would not anticoagulate him. But the fact that it's three days, they may consider doing it. But if they did that, they would probably use um, a low weight-based heparin, which would be the Lovenox, if they did that at all. Um, so now he went, he had surgery, went home. And then several weeks later, he came in with chest pain, shortness of breath, and had a PE. And now we're going to start anticoagulation. So under these circumstances, what are you going to do? Would this be the time to trot out a heavier anticoagulant drug? Yes. I think it would, because now he's demonstrating that he's that he's clotting right so that would definitely be an issue um so i would anticipate that he would probably be put on warfarin possibly at this point so why do you think that happened that he had that clot he was probably immobilized to some degree. He couldn't get up and move, obviously from his broken bone, but um, they probably for safety wanted to keep him down because he wasn't as coherent. 
Exactly. And, 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 you know, that's such a good point. You really see how you, you, how difficult it is to do what needs to be done with someone that is, you know, that you can't reason with and that may not be safe. Chances are good they did not anticoagulate him previously. And the reason for that would have been going into surgery. I know when people would come in with MIs and they would have to do open heart surgery, um, oh, the surgeons would go berserk if, <laughs> if they found out that they'd been on anticoagulants all along at home because it just makes the surgery so much more dangerous. All right. So he never returned to baseline. And honestly, that is, that is so true in, in the majority of cases of the elderly and broken, broken hips. And they ended up sending him to hospice and he died several months later. Thoughts on that? Nothing there. This probably happens like um, kind of frequently, though, huh? What happens frequently? Like they don't recover and then shortly die after this dramatic event. It does. It does. It is very difficult for you know for the average elderly person, and and I think part of that is because you know. And particularly this fellow, let's think about it. He had coronary artery disease. He had diabetes. What do we know about diabetics and healing? Yeah, they don't heal all that great, do they? No. So that probably, and when you have somebody that is diabetic and they don't have the best sugar control, which a lot of times they don't, but think about how many times have you taken a, in lab or at work, a finger stick and tried to get blood, one drop of blood out of a <laughs> diabetic. Sometimes you got to practically turn them upside down and shake them just to get one drop because their blood is so thick and syrupy. So it really impairs their circulation further. And he already has CAD. So on top of the fact that he's diabetic, it impairs circulation not getting adequate oxygen and nutrients to any time you are sick or you have an injury, you need extra oxygen, extra nutrients. You need all kinds of extra stuff for that healing process to happen. You need a lot of protein. What do you think an elderly, an 82 year old's diet, especially someone with dementia, what do you think their diet is like? Yeah, it's pretty bad. I mean, even if, even when they get into a home or are at home, it's very difficult sometimes to get them to eat, period. And so, you know, you've got to have protein in order to heal appropriately. So, you know, older people are a challenge. Older people with dementia are a bigger challenge. Older people with dementia and all of these comorbid comorbidities are an even bigger challenge. And so that really is why when you start putting all that together, that's really why they tend to have poor outcomes. You know, it's not just one thing. It is when you start adding all those things up, the cumulative effect is they just start to go downhill and don't recover well. So any questions for me about absolutely anything? No? You got it, we're good. Musculoskeletal, we're ready to rock and roll on that. Okay. Well, I enjoyed hanging out with you guys today. Thank you for playing with me and good luck on the next exam. And I hope everything goes well and your instructor will be back next week. All right. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.